Hello and welcome. Thanks to uh, a big thanks to our host Tapper and Through Vision, and special thanks to you for finding time in your busy diaries. In the next hour, we will give you an introduction to Through Vision technology, including a live demo. I will share with you the challenges faced in transforming a conventional security function into a modern loss uh, function in Next PLC. John will share his experience of utilizing Through Vision in Clipper. We will have a summary review of the survey results and then hopefully we'll take your questions. This is a new audience for me, so a little bit more information about my background. I've enjoyed a career in security, loss prevention and risk management spanning 40 plus years. I've enjoyed success in a number of blue chip market leading retailers and solution providers in the last couple of years. I attribute my success to a number of factors, uh, but one of these is a career long commitment to collaboration. TAPA is a fantastic example of collaboration, and this webinar is testament to their commitment to joint success. Benchmarking of standards and incidents is particularly important for supply chain security and resilience professionals, and TAPA provide this exceptionally well. Next slide, please, Otto. Just want to just before we uh, just before I move over to Otto and we and we move to the uh, exciting live demo. Just wanted to touch on, uh, uh, put some context to why why we specifically want to talk about uh, the transformation and importance of innovation and technology within warehouse and distribution. Uh, so how technology is transferred in security and omni-channel retail. Stock file accuracy is more critical than ever to retailers and technology is playing a bigger part in achieving this and we will provide examples of this in this webinar. Quite simply, if products aren't on the shelf or in pick locations, they can't be sold. I think one very important observation for me in the, in the last eight months or so, employee safety has become more important during this pandemic. But one of the downsides to that uh, within retail has been uh, an increase in shop theft and, and associated violence. Uh, one solution that retailers are implementing at the moment is increasing their self-scan capability. But this is driving up losses as self-scan avoidance is increasing rapidly. Uh, research and development to find available and reliable AI solutions is very significant in this area. And across the group of retailers that I consult or engage with, uh, certainly uh, food retailers, it's probably the single biggest challenge that uh, these guys are, are facing at the moment. So things aren't Things aren't necessarily improving uh, in terms of uh, in in terms of retail theft uh, and violence, but there are some uh, there are some uh, exciting uh, exciting investments and lots of innovation in this area. So on that note, I'd like to hand over to Otto. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Colin, and uh, thank you again, Up um, and rest of the Tapa team for having us this morning, and uh, especially to all of you attendees for scheduling some some time aside this morning for being with us. So, uh, before we move to the uh, live demo, which is definitely the most interactive uh, part of the presentation, and we really hope you like it, I would like to quickly introduce um, True Vision. So. Um, the topic of this webinar is, is all about transformation and innovation is a key uh, driver for transformation. Um, with True Vision, we have a unique and innovative uh, screening technology serving a wide range of markets from customs to law enforcement to, um, uh, to logistics. And logistics, um, we continue to learn in this market. Uh, it's, it's growing rapidly for the last two years for us. Um, and just a little bit about the technology we are having. Um, uh, innovation is close to our heart. Um, and just almost 20 years ago, uh, the European Space Agency um, um, found a, uh, a new technology called Terahertz as part of their project, uh, their Star Tiger project, to, which was really aimed at dramatically reducing the turnaround time for key technological developments. And that piece of technology, we still hold uh, multiple uh, patents on and we commercialized into the screening products we are using today. And um, what is so, um, uh, what, is, what is a key differentiator on, on our technology is that we are very effective in the way that we detect both uh, metallic and non-metallic items at a safe distance of three meters. And 
uh, especially the COVID crisis um, has been a big driver for us or kind of turned that safe distance correct characteristic into a, a unique selling point, really. Um, as we can see in the illustration at the top, right? We want to move from unsafe, ineffective uh, people screen, close proximity people screening methodologies into more safe distance, both for the guards as well as for the uh, for the employees, of course. Um, so uh, I think that's that's just a very brief introduction to to our technology, and, and I hope it provides some more context for the rest of the presentation. Um, moving into the live demo, where my colleague Mark Fear, who is sitting in our demo room in the UK, will share his screen um, shortly. Thank you, Mark. So what we're looking at is currently. So this is the operator view, so really what the guard sees, it's a touch screen on our system. Um, just a few uh, features on our system. It's a very lightweight solution. It's a mobile solution, so you can, it's flexible in, in its deployment. And John uh, um, will will just elaborate a little bit more on that, um, how we uh, use that feature into Clipper. Um, what we're looking at is really the guarding view. So on the left hand side, we see our terahertz technology. It's the the green ghost, um, what we call, you see the um, you see the uh, the energy already uh, a bit flowing, right? You see it greenish, blackish, and on the right hand side, it's an onboard HD camera to ensure the guard doesn't really lose sight of the actual situation, right? So he can watch over a screen, but he can also have it all together on the screen, both the terahertz picture and the um, the HD view. Uh, what is important to notice is that the camera, right, our point of view, is three meters away from the mat, and you can see the different footsteps on the mat, which are indicating the four stance posts we require um, from people to take to do a full screening round. Um, um, so how it really works is that our camera is, is passive, so it's one-on-one -on -one comparable with a normal CCTV camera. We don't radiate anything. What we do is we take the body heat, the body energy, and we picture a green ghost. And anything that's between the skin and the camera will be shown as a concealment. So if Mark will now step on the mat, um, all the energy from Mark's body will be transformed into this, into a green ghost, as we all can see. Um, from this green ghost, you, you, ghost you, you really can't tell age, you can't tell gender, you can't tell ethnicity. So it's, it's non-invasive technology we are using here. Um, so this is what we call a clean scan, right? So a guard is, can very quickly see whether or not someone is carrying an actual item. So if Mark just quickly turns around, we can just see and make sure also on his inner parts, right? I mean, the inner parts of his legs, his arms, we, we don't see any concealments at the moment. So now if, if Mark would put any items on him, just now in a second uh, and get back on the mat. So then we pretend uh, Mark is a DC employee, right? He finished his shift. He went through metal detection, right? Nothing was detected on him. Uh, but hey, he got picked up or selected by a randomizer to go through to true vision. So we don't necessarily say that we eliminate metal detectors. We are very often an additional layer of security. So again, we see Mark here on the mat. And, and we see clearly something is hidden under his clothes. So Mark is wearing a fleece jacket, right? And um, and, and, and normal pants and shoes. Um, one comment here is that we don't look through shoes. So as you can see down below at his ankles, that's where the energy stops, right? We don't see true skin and effectively leather shoes are skin, right? So Mark, if, if you would be so kind to um, to reveal what you have hidden on your, under your um, under your fleece jacket. So that is a polo shirt, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So a polo shirt, right? Um, we are active in many warehouses, DCs, uh, where uh, high value apparel is being distributed. Uh, very often targets, uh, you know, for, 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 I mean, very often stolen by, by people. Yeah. So if Mark holds it now in front of him, um, folds it out, we won't see it anymore, right? And this is exactly the reason why we don't see Mark's, the clothes Mark, uh, Mark is wearing, because our technology penetrates to multiple layers 
of uh, of fabric, right? That's because of the wavelength we are using all the way down to the skin. So if Mark would wear this shirt out of the warehouse, we, we wouldn't be able to pick it up. But very often when things are being stolen and folded up in multiple layers, then we will be able to, to catch it. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, and then we, we see some other items in your pockets, Mark. So would you be so kind to show us what you have there? Perfect. So a bottle of vodka. So you like to drink at work, Mark? <laughs> yeah. So again, non-metallic liquids, um, very effective in picking up those items. Um, can be uh, dangerous, right? Operating heavy machineries, lorry drivers while drinking. So we want to prevent that. Um, yeah. Left hand side pocket, please. That's your phone. OK, well, yeah, perfect. So again, phones are not always being picked up by metal detectors. We are able to pick them up. So Mark, if, if you would do kind of a turn, so take the, the different steps. So right now, if we, if we see, and of course, training is an essential part of this, uh, we see a, a little black spot at Mark's uh, ankle on his left leg, so left ankle. There's something hidden in your sock. And what is it? OK, a pack of cigarettes. There you go. Yeah, you, you sh we shouldn't take any cigarettes into the warehouse, no lighters. So that's something we want to prevent. Yeah, so turn around, please, Mark. That's all clean. Hey, wait a second. There's still something. So this is an L shape. So that could be interesting. So Mark, would you be so kind to show us what you have there? So that's a 3D printed gun, uh, not so much of an issue, luckily for us, right, in Europe, but uh, we have various use cases in, in the United States where inbound screening of employees is a standard to prevent uh, people taking arms into the DCs. We all know these stories about shooting, so yeah, we, we obviously are happy we can contribute with our technology from you know, safeguarding uh, people at their work. Yeah, so that's all good. Yeah, all clean and good to go. So uh, a, a question that is frequently asked here is, OK, wh what can you see, right? I mean, we are always very transparent about things we cannot see and what we can see. I mean, I already indicated we can't see inside shoes if you, if you would wear a a piece of a t-shirt or a polo shirt out of a warehouse, we wouldn't be able to see that. Um, there are limitations always, right? There is no uh, technology out there that can see it all, that have it all, that has 100% capability. So we will see with this machine, it's in loss prevention camera, eight channels, um, which is kind of a mid-range machine frequently used in uh, distribution centers. Uh, we can see down to three by three centimeters. Sometimes we see a little bit more, uh, but yeah, it, it, that, that's kind of what down to the size that we can guarantee. So Mark, if you would be so kind to put some smaller items on you and appear again into the screen. So we can we can see here that there is some black spots in Mark's pocket. I mean, it's clearly visible. This is by no means a clean scan, as we would say, as we would call it. So. Yeah, if you move a little bit, we, we can clearly see there's something on you. So if a guard in this situation is, is a bit, well, in doubt, I would say, there's an additional feature we could use here, which is um, a super slow scan. It takes a little bit more time to build up the picture, but it gives increased detail on the potential concealment. So Mark, if you would be so kind to move it to a super slow scan and then Stand back on the on the mat again. Here we go. So it takes a little bit more time to build up the image because it's taking more detail. So there you go. Now we can clearly see you have something on you. So Mark, can, can you show us what it is? There you go. So it's a it's a tin of Vaseline. Yeah, thank you. Well, wait a minute. So there's still something. I still saw you just pulled out a tin of Vaseline on your left hand pocket. 
but there's still something uh, below that. So that's why we call it double detection, right? So you can't fool the guard here. There you go. So what is that? That's a lipstick, lipstick. right? Okay, yeah. A lipstick, which is also frequently, well, it, it could be high theft material, right? And then, if I'm not mistaken, there's still something in your right hand side pocket. So, would you be so kind to show us what it is, Mark? A pack of Tic Tacs. Okay, yeah. Got it. So, Mark, so maybe we can now go back to normal again. Normal and then put some, uh, maybe it's nice to show to, to the people, to the attendees, uh, the different color palettes we, we, we offer. So we were talking about the green ghost all the time. If you, you've been looking at the green ghost all the time. So if Mark puts some middle size items on him, we could show you the different color palettes. Um, it's, it's really a matter of uh, preference. So this is black body, white background. So you can clearly see the, 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 the items uh, Mark is carrying are turned white. Um, then we have the opposite, white body, black background. Yeah, there you go. Also very clear. Thank you, Mark. And then at last we have the, the most funky and flashy one. And for the ones who are for the Terminator fans under us. This is now really Terminator style. So yeah, it's it's a matter of preference. We have, uh, we see mostly, the, the one mostly used is the Green Ghost because it's just, it's, it's very clear, but yeah, we also have customers using the, the red version or the white or the black one. So that's uh, that's really kind of a short demo of True Vision. Um, just to notice it, maybe Mark, so yeah, maybe you could show the, um, go back to the Green Ghost again, just as a, as a closing, in closing, we, we can show the, um, for the people who are concerned about privacy, we can switch off the CCTV. So there you go. So in case you are concerned about privacy and we all know privacy is important to our people, um, here you go. So there's nothing you can see. I must say our tool is, is mostly used as a real-time tool um, in case you would like to take a snapshot with a pre-recording, we can. In case you would like to do continuous recording, we can. In case you would like to link it to a current VMS system, we can. But I must say it is being used as a flexible um, uh, mobile uh, real-time unit, really, uh, for, for screening purposes, just like you know metal detection is. But we are just a bit more effective, I would say. Um, thank you. So that, that's it for the uh, for the demo. I really hope uh, you all liked it. Uh, just switching back to the slide. I, hope, uh, I yep. already have some questions related to the uh, demo. So okay. uh, Colin, maybe. if you allow me to ask the questions. Sure, yeah, maybe yes, we pause here Sorry. and uh, yeah, that's fine. So the first question on the uh, demo is or, or, or on your technology. is uh, coming from Carson and you're asking, what is the smallest size of material which can be discovered? Would it be, for example, also capture SD cards? Yeah, so that's that's again, we have limitations. So great question and thank you for, for your question, Carsten, first of all. So uh, this system is an eight channel system. So we have a four channel that we'll see down to five by five centimeters. We have an eight channel, that's this one you, you're looking at. Yeah, we'll see down to three by three centimeters. And then we have an, a higher spec system, with, uh, which is a 16 channel. Uh, which we'll see down to two by two centimeters. The challenge really is if you want to start picking up smaller items, you're going to have more uh, false detections because what you will, what you will see, you start to see is buttons, uh, flies, zippers, all those little details will start to be uh, visible and which will impact the throughput on, uh, on, on your exit screening procedure. Um, SD cards is special, yeah, we, we can do that, but then we, we would need a high, highly controlled environment, temperatures playing in here as well, so air conditioning would be required, and then uniforms, potentially kind of medical style uniforms without any fly zippers, buttons, then yeah, we would potentially be able to see SD cards, but no guarantees. 
Um, and that's also why we would like, in, in case we have interest from customers, we, we always, uh, almost always execute a um, four to six weeks operational trial. We identify KPIs and then we will just measure on the different various, well, on the various items a customer would like to pick up. Hope this answered the question. Thank you. Then, um, yeah, of course, some people in the audience are interested uh, about uh, the time a scan takes, especially related to the shift changes in a warehouse yep. where there is a large flow of people. Yeah, sure. So throughput is, um, is, is of course, of interest. Um, we all understand uh, workers, employees of warehouses, I mean, they are they're working hard, right? They, they're doing three shifts sometimes a day, maybe more. Um, and they want to go home. What you don't want to do is put these people in a queue for 30 minutes. So we are very well aware of, of the fact uh, throughput is an, a critical piece in the procedure, in the process. Um, so typically, uh, we did lots of measuring, uh, also comparisons between metal detection and um, so proper wanding, which can take uh, a lot of time, all the way up to a minute as well. Our screening round usually takes around 12 seconds. So uh, to, to do the full uh, 360. Um, yeah, that, that's that's more or less 12 seconds. Uh, what is important here also to mention is that we also have a hands-off randomizer, right? So people wave in front of the randomizer, so it's all uh, COVID friendly, um, COVID safe, I should say. Um, and then, um, yeah, it's really the balance on randomization and deterrence, right? And we find that the balance is around 20%. So if you set that randomizer at 20%, and making sure uh, every employee is being screened with True Vision once a week, um, that's where you will reach your deterrence already. So again, uh, all of these KPIs we can uh, demonstrate during a operational trial. Otto, can I can I can I suggest you take the uh, take the question? Sorry, it's I can't see it now. If you can take the question about the screening capabilities, if shoes or boots are removed. And then we will take the rest of the questions uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the yeah. webinar. Thank I have you. the same idea, Colin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, oh, that's good. So, what what was again the question? So, if you uh, wear no shoes, then the feet and the ankle will be visible. Yes, they will. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Thank you for that, uh, Colin. Go ahead, please. You're sure. Very, so let, you let me share my screen again. And thank you, Mark, again for being our model this morning. No problem. Yeah, so as I indicated with True Vision, we, we are already successful in, in customs, right, where we are detecting weapons, drugs, cash, um, successful in law enforcement, right, with different use cases. Um, so logistics has been a market that we have been tapping into for the last two years. Um, and I just want to really touch on our experience, uh, why, why we are growing so rapidly, right? Close to 50% into this market over the last year. It's really on, I mean, traditional retail models are disrupted, right? We see a rapid change in, um, in, in, in retailers ex starting to execute or executed on omnichannel uh, distribution models to make sure they can continue to serve their customers in the way they would like to. So allowing same day delivery, uh, buy online, pick up in store, buy online, return in store. So in the end, it's all about the end customers. So, yeah, I think this is just um, a nice overview on what is happening in today's market and why we see such such growth rates. Um, traditional retail, very straightforward on factory, um, right, transport, di distribution and then the, the store. And then nowadays we see more and more retailers really um, uh, outsourcing their logistics uh, very often to multiple 3PLs, uh, creating a much more uh, a complex supply chain landscape, I would say. Um, and um, yeah, I think in the end it's, it's, it's about legacy tools and techniques, techniques that, were, that were previously uh, successful are no longer effective. And, from a true vision, true vision perspective, this is really creating a big market from us. For us, we are uh, very grateful and happy we can just partner up alongside of 3PLs, retailers, and even grocery chains um, to really continue to, uh, to to fight those challenges. Um, so yeah, this this is really a final closing slide on why we are so so active in in, in this business. 
Um, handing it back over to you, Colin. Thank, thank you, Otto, Mark, uh, and Mark. Thanks very much for the live demo. Always, uh, always a risky thing in a, in a demo. So thank you very much for that. I just want to, I just want to now uh, share some of my, some of my experience and uh, and a story, if you like, through my six and a half years with Next PLC, uh, and specifically around the uh, what I found when I when I initially joined uh, the the business. And then when I left uh, just over two years ago, where where we were. So when I joined Next PLC in 2013 as Group Loss Prevention Manager, I was responsible for retail security, corporate security, online fraud prevention and warehouse and distribution security. As part of my induction with directors and grade one managers, I usually ask them to describe the function relevant to their area in three words. Disappointingly, the most common responses included reliable, steady, reactive, good in an emergency. I didn't hear words such as innovative, engaged, risk taking or similar. Uh, the conventional warehouse and distribution security fun ad function, as detailed in this slide, was broadly what I discovered in, in Next. A good core team of supervisors and officers, but lacking investment, engagement and the leadership required to evolve and meet the fast business growth. And a great example of that is that next we're just gearing up. Uh, this is the online uh, online part of the business, a two billion pound business. We're just gearing up to move from eight o'clock ordering to uh, guaranteed next day delivery, moving it to 10 o'clock. And then during my time, that moved to midnight, which was a, a massive logistical challenge. Uh, but sadly, we, were, we weren't engaged in those key conversations around, uh, around what it would do to the, to the resource, to the, to the shift patterns. We were, we were very much at the end of the chain. So we would be, uh, we would literally wouldn't be engaged. Uh, we would didn't have a seat at the, at the top table, and we would fundamentally then just uh, find out and be told what we were going to do, in rather than influencing that. Uh, next slide, thanks, Otto. Uh, this slide, which is courtesy of Professor Adrian Beck, is designed to give you an idea of the complexity of the challenge facing modern omni-channel loss prevention. Uh, sorry, modern omni-channel loss prevention professional. Uh, all of these areas uh, can contribute to loss, but to try and tackle them all would be a recipe for failure. And I, I, I certainly, I certainly know some businesses who who tried that. Uh, I had a fantastic boss in my last five years at Next, who was a, a visionary, a smart, and risk taking. Uh, and he asked me. Uh, I took him through this. We were involved in the initial uh, uh, development work with Adrian Beck. And he asked me to choose an area. Well, in 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 essence, he kind of steered me towards it, and it was around non-malicious loss in e-commerce. Now, I can't I can't disclose the actual shrinkage numbers that we were reporting at that time. But if you think of a two billion pound business, even if those uh, even if those identified fraud losses were uh, 0.5 percent, it was a significant a significant amount of money. What we actually did, we looked at the non-malicious element of that, and and that was particularly around customer compensation, goodwill payments, and we found that that pot that pot actually matched the fraud losses at that time. That we we were we were starting to get some very effective fraud prevention tools online in place, but that that was quite scary. Uh, and so what we did. Rather than try and address this whole total retail loss, we we I chose specific areas in each of my in each of my uh, departments. So really, the key is to identify those risks creating the greatest loss and agree a plan to improve them all uh, that stakeholders commit to and they all understand the benefits. Uh, and to quote my, uh, uh, my my boss at that time, he would frequently remind us that the plan can change, but the end goal can't. Currently, in my view, the single biggest challenge for warehouse and distribution loss prevention teams is to is to obtain buy-in and support for the reintroduction of the core security controls that existed pre-COVID. I see in here of examples where staff searching has been has been discontinued indefinitely, and where basic access control measures have been removed or compromised. Yeah. Many of the staff working in warehouse and distribution now have not worked with the basic security controls, particularly searching. 
and many will be taking advantage of these changes. Uh, some, in fact, will be working for certain businesses specifically because of the opportunity for theft and collusion. Many, many of you will have stories of creativity from internal thieves. Uh, I'll just give you one example. When Next introduced a new range of luxury watches, these were eight, 800 to 1,000 pounds uh, for online sales, we were actually unable to fulfill these orders within a few days as a small quantity of stock was no longer there, uh, it, that they'd been stolen. Uh, covert investigations were able to allow us to focus searches on specific staff, and we discovered the watches in drinks bottles filled with protein powder, and interestingly enough, coming back to the last point that Otto uh, answered, uh, hollowed out shoes. So again, it, it does require a mixture of, uh, uh, of investigations and, uh, and also core, core screening uh, solutions. Otto, I'm conscious of time and I, wanna, I want to try and make sure we get as many questions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover the survey results at the end, if that's OK with you. And then if you can move on to the proven solutions. I think that's a good idea. Thank you. We'll come back to them. OK, so this, this, was, a, this was the situation. This was probably a five-year uh, five journey, all told, uh, across transforming because all of the uh, uh, retail was a significant challenge. Uh, and, but the warehouse and distribution was, was the growth area and where, and where the big focus was. So the essential change in the catalyst for the transformation of that function at Next was a change of leadership. Uh, employing an experienced industry person with proven track record of success and enthusiasm for change was absolutely critical. Uh, in line with all the group security functions, the warehouse and distribution team were rebranded to loss prevention, the uniform was changed to a more modern style, and for the first time we invested in uh, training, particularly uh, non-confrontational investigation skills training. Uh, timely, accurate data was essential, uh, and by focusing on a relatively low volume of products, it was possible to complete a full end-to-end -end product cycle review. And when I say relatively small, I am talking between 10 and 15, because what we found, particularly on the introduction of through vision, what we found is, not surprisingly, we rarely found people stealing uh, next uh, boxer shorts, but uh, Calvin Klein, Armani, Boss, etc. So we really focused on the branded on the branded products, and also with the uh, I'm, I'm working with a couple of uh, well certainly I'm working with one large uh, food retailer at the moment on uh, on improving their DC security. And they actually they actually focus on only about eight eight lines uh, specifically around uh, particularly around CCTV analytics and search processes. So tobacco, uh, wines and spirits, uh, baby formula, etc. Uh, uh, detergent tablets are a big loss area currently in retail and warehouse and distribution. <clears throat> so the. That one of the key things that uh, was we built our success on was the introduction of an electronic incident reporting and resource management tool. Uh, we started to get accurate data on missing high-risk products, empty packaging, and we had the ability to report issues of non-compliance during warehouse patrols. Uh, the solution that Next chose after a, quite a, an extensive review was Tractic. Uh, and we implemented that very successfully, and then I am now uh, I'm, I'm now aware and work with several very good resource management solutions. The the key to the improvement, though, uh, not surprising given this uh, given the uh, the subject of this uh, webinar, was the introduction of through vision safe screening cameras into the largest DC. Uh, it was a significant element in the successful improvement program. Uh, the technology proved effective immediately, it empowered the LP staff, it reduced potential conflict, and the investment in new tech made the officers feel good about their roles and the function. And that was particularly important for us at that time. We also introduced body-worn cameras for LP officers, and this saw a, an immediate reduction in incidents of verbal, uh, verbal abuse and aggression, uh, aggressive behaviour. Uh, and so based on identifying proven loss, redu uh, proven loss reduction across a group of between 8 and 14 high value products, a return on investment from through vision was delivered in under nine months, which is exceptional. Uh, <clears throat> the final piece was a three year investment program for CCTV upgrades. Uh, 
including internal cameras, which was to support the investigations team that we uh, that we uh, we were building, and then smart analytics were added to the online packing stations, and that helped to significantly challenge uh, fraudulent goods not in parcel claims. So the customer the customer orders a uh, yeah. Uh, a very expensive branded product for £80 and they also order a pair of £5 socks and they claim the socks, the £5 socks are in there, but the expensive item wasn't in there. So that's not uncommon. Thank you, Otto, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Colin, for thank sharing uh, those stories. So, yeah, I guess for us, for, for True Vision, it's all about uh, continue to learn, right? Innovation uh, makes us better every day, finding new ways to success and really in the end, supporting our customer base in finding new um, uh, compelling uh, use cases, but also business cases. That's where we are committed to. Um, I think the takeaway from this slide is really that we uh, we continue to learn. Um, these are some big names in the industry, um, 3PLs, retailers, uh, but even grocery chains. And these are no, not customers to us. These are partners, right? We are in partnerships. Um, we, are, we are aiming for long-term partnerships so we can continue to grow together. Um, and if we just drill into each of these, well, I'm not going to go through, all, through, through each of the customers, but really, if you, if you see, look at the boots, for example, health and beauty, we're talking, right, theft items such as lipsticks, uh, perfumes, foundations. Um, I think it shows that we are successful across, across, a, uh, across a variety of businesses, um, uh, DVDs, PlayStation games, but then even uh, sportswear, right, uh, sneakers, um, uh, shirts, any, anything that's, that's being sold into, um, um, into, into consumers, basically. Um, and then if you touch on the 3PL industry, um, Siva Logistics is here, DPD, right? Clipper, of course, which, which we will get to in, into a minute. That's where it, it's, it's very much about reducing contractual risk, uh, but also differentiation, right? We all know that security standards are, uh, are being increased, right? The expectation from end customers are very high, especially when you talk about high value items. Uh, and we know very well that there are challenges, and yeah, and we are help. We are here to uh, to overcome those challenges. So yeah, again, we are very grateful that we continue to learn and can act as a true partner to all these businesses. Um, one of our partners, right, is Clipper, uh, right in the middle. Um, Clipper, we 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 learned a lot together with Clipper. And uh, again, thank you, John, for for being with us this morning and speaking on behalf of Clipper. So over to you. Thank you, Otto, uh, and good morning to everybody. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Tapper and True Vision for organising this uh, webinar and inviting me to uh, describe the circumstances that led to Clipper becoming a user through Vision technology. Uh, by way of a little bit of background, my experience in secure operations derives from uh, 10 years as general manager of a customs and excise approved facility, predominantly handling tobacco. Uh, for the past six years, this site has been accredited to Tapper FSR, a and TSR1 standards. We also run a secure transport operation to support our tobacco customers and have a dedicated fleet for that purpose. Uh, I personally became a, a TAPA audited, uh, accredited auditor back in 2015 and have gone through various revisions <coughs> excuse me, of the FSR and TSR standards since then, including the infamous iValue cage. The Clipper growth stories uh, needs, needs to be explained to, uh, to to people just to give some context to the the nature and the the reasons for the challenges that we've experienced in the last two years. The the company was created in 1992 with just four employees. Today, the company has over 10,000 employees and a market value of around 850 million pounds. We're one of the UK's leading independent logistics companies with a turnover now of about 650 million. Uh, that's based on RFY20 financial results. RFY21 uh, results are due to be published in a couple of weeks, and I expect those numbers to be significantly higher at that point in time. Uh, currently, we are, have a network of 54 European sites that spread predominantly through the UK, but as you can see on the graphic, we now have a significant number uh, throughout Netherlands, Germany and Poland. Uh, th this is actually a, a, a positive strategy by Clipper, to move into European operation has been driven by a lot of our customer base uh, requiring European presence for their e-commerce and retail distribution 
driven by Brexit. Initially, we were, we were going down a path of uh, looking to create customs warehouses to continue to serve the European markets from within the UK. But it quickly became uh, appropriate that actually a better strategy is to actually create a European presence and feed the European market from within Europe and reposition the UK operations to dedicate themselves to UK retail and e-tail. In total, at the last count, and this is this is a number that changes almost monthly, we had 11.8 million square foot of warehousing space. Uh, I'm not sure what the exact figure is as of today, but again, that figure is nearly a year out of date. I would expect in the next annual report that we've probably reached a figure more akin to 14, even 15 million square foot with the new sites that have come on stream uh, in, in the last year. <clears throat> Just touching on uh, the, the TSR, the, the, the fleet, we, we do run a, a fleet of 350 vehicles, but importantly for, for TAPA membership, uh, the, the dedicated TAPA accredited TSR1 fleet is around 20 vehicles. And again, that's predominantly moving tobacco uh, and what we would call high value and cash equivalent products for one of our supermarket customers. This scale of growth has been quite impressive. Uh, our, uh, our annual report for FY20 suggests that the movement of product into e-tail uh, from retail through FY19 to FY20 was around 20%. Again, there's a PLC about to publish results for FY21. I'm not allowed to sort of share the figures for growth in the last year, but uh, I can suggest that reports from other industries and other, other uh, uh, affiliated companies such as the couriers uh, suggest that the growth in e-commerce, <clears throat> excuse me, over the last year has been something like what they would have expected over a three-year period rather than a one-year period. And I would expect that our internal operations supporting the warehousing side of that have, have grown pro rata. Uh, this has been driven clearly by two things. One is the natural adoption of online uh, purchasing by the consumer but also by the COVID-19 pandemic and mainly by the, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has driven the consumer into online shopping. Interestingly enough, even as retail in the UK, and I'm not sure what the, what the, what the experience is across Europe, even as this, this, uh, the retail sector has opened uh, or reopened, what we're not seeing is a drift back into retail the people who converted through through the worst aspects of the lockdown in the in the UK market certainly are remaining within that. Their their buying habits have changed by the pandemic, and we're not seeing a movement back to 2019, early 2020 volumes. Uh, and this would appear now to be a permanent change of buying habits. This growth, although it's uh, it's exceptional for our business, uh, did not come without some challenges, uh, and significantly a, a loss prevention challenge. Uh, in, in Q2 2020, we, we started uh, to, to hear stories from, from our various general managers, especially in our high value fashion operations, that the, 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 the incidence of loss uh, was, was, was moving uh, out of scale to the increase in, in, uh, in, in the volumes. Uh, and what, what we actually saw when we investigated this, we, we literally had a perfect storm of increasing risk factors within our warehouse operations. The, the, the exceptional growth driven by the pandemic and the change of buying habits obviously increased volumes. But we also had a, uh, a corresponding reduction, and, and Colin touched on this earlier, in our ability to enforce good security practices on site. So in order to, co uh, to, 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 to mitigate the effects of the pandemic, we had to do such things as reducing our search procedures where these were traditional search procedures driven by a guard almost face to face with an employee and a, and a metal detecting one that no longer became possible because of the need for social distancing we had to introduce open door policies to uh, allow for air to circulate through facilities uh, we even had to open fire doors on certain sites to allow for one-way systems to be created for the movement of staff through sites and all of these to, 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 to us guys in the loss prevention world would, would be an absolute nightmare scenario, to be honest. Uh, it's difficult to walk around sites and see some of the things that have had to be put in place. Uh, and, and clearly, I'm sure we're all in a position now where we're all looking forward to the day when we can return to the standards we had in place in 2019, 2020. 
uh, and, and hopefully that's coming in the next few months. We also saw uh, an increasing demand uh, for agency labour to support this growth. That demand for additional labour was compounded by the loss of available labour due to Brexit, as we did see a lot of uh, available workers returning, uh, returning back into Europe predominantly uh, as the threat of Brexit and citizenship basically made them reassess their, their, their position in the world. Uh, so we're losing labour, we're, be, we're requiring more labour and inevitably that's driving us into uh, areas of labour employment we might not wanted to have gone previously. We are now becoming more desperate for labour. Are we reducing our standards in the labour and the background checks that we're able to put, put in place? Yes, we are. Uh, and, and, and we're not really yet in a position where we've recovered that quality uh, of, of, of background checking on the people we're bringing in. We're also now moving our, our general strategy on labour to become far less reliant on, on agency labour. Some of, some of our sites may well have run at 50-50, 60-40 splits. We now have a strategy in place to be no worse than 75-25, even on our most labour intensive sites at peak. And also through this period, because Clipper became engaged in a operation to support the NHS with the distribution of PPE, we saw the rapid introduction of new facilities, big sheds, anything off scale was pretty much snapped up by the Department of Health and Social Care and was filled with PPE. Uh, and, and this is an operation that, that Clipper stood up over the course of three or four weeks back in March 2020, something I was actually involved in at the very start of. Uh, and, and, and that introduced a, a rapid number of additional sites. And in introducing these sites and having to stand them up very quickly to respond to the pandemic, we did not have the opportunity to introduce good standards from start. We, we also, so I touched on earlier, the, 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 incre the, the threats of Brexit actually drove a lot of our customer base to investigate customs warehouses. And subsequently, we did open and we have opened four additional customs warehouse operations in the UK for some of our key brands. Uh, but but with, the, with the introduction of customs wa uh, warehousing comes the requirement for compliance with HMRC. And that in itself demanded that our security standards on a number of sites needed to be uh, elevated. So our initial answer, our initial response was, was to, to, to set a strategy to adopt C uh, as the, as the uh, minimum standard that we would, we would apply on these sites. Uh, and that's, that's something my, myself and my team here at Rotherham, having had experience with TAPA initially rolled out, and subsequently, we were able to put uh, three other general managers and now completed their audit training course. And we will continue to that. And again, the ambition is that every GM on every Clipper site will become an accredited auditor, certainly to FSR, not necessarily to TSR, uh, but certainly to FSR. And will then be ultimately for uh, for the, the adoption of C on their sites and the maintenance of C as a standard. But one thing that we, we do see, though, that in, in C, the, the, there's no real requirement for, for exit searches, even in the 2020 standard. If you look at 7.4.25, uh, it, it's only required for A sites to have any, to any type of exit search uh, activity in place. Uh, so we needed to go somewhere else. And, and bearing in mind as well, the, the, the big issue we had was with fashion. So even if we had a, an, a policy of uh, searches and one searches, we, we would have had very little success. It's it's almost a, a, an inconsequential deterrent, to be honest. The staff know that certain garments are not going to be picked up. It's it's almost a risk worth taking, given the value of some of the items that we're dealing with. So in addition to the standard uh, C that we're looking to introduce, we needed to find some additional technology to help us uh, with, with the search process. And then this led us to the, uh, to the ThruVision technology, which initially we trialled on our site in Northampton. Uh, we're looking at ThruVision because of the deployment flexibility. It, it can be installed on a site in, in less than two hours. It's also very flexible in that uh, it can be lifted and moved from site to site, although in doing that, you've obviously lessened your protection on your site you've come, come away from. Uh, the training of operators on a site can be, can be completed in two, two to three hours. Uh, it's a very simple technology to, to use. We did actually get a lot of uh, soft benefits as well from the guards and the employees who appreciated that this technology actually gave them protection 
uh, over that three metre distance from the impacts of, of COVID. Uh, and and, and it, for, for that reason, we were able to reintroduce searches on some sites that we'd taken it away for, but we were able to reintroduce it in a safe manner. And again, it, it's important to, to, to just mention to you the, the range of detection capabilities that Clipper requires across its various sites. Although we, we, we acknowledge that a one, for example, can pick up metallic items, through vision will pick up the non-metallic items. You've seen there, for example, the, 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 the pack of Tic Tacs, which is effectively plastic and, 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 and confectionery. But for us, the, the fashion items were the big prize to be able to detect uh, the T-shirts uh, pushed, pushed up a, a fleece, as we've seen uh, in the demo. Uh, that, that was the key for us in, in selecting and trialling through vision. Uh, and, and incidentally, one anecdote, we, we also identified on one search an employee with over a thousand pound in cash uh, in his pockets, which I think is a certain indicator of some sort of uh, inappropriate activity taken on site. So ultimately, there, there, were, there were items detected that indicated not necessarily theft, but certain other inappropriate activity. The, the rollout so far uh, has, has actually uh, gone on to uh, three installations uh, completed. These are at our sites at Daventry, Sherburn, and at our site at Venray in the Netherlands. Uh, and we have four additional installations currently uh, under, under approval uh, and, and feasibility study, which will probably take place throughout the, the, the rest of this year. To summarise the, the benefits that, that we as Clipper found in our specific business, uh, if, uh, the, the reduced loss initially is through detection, but ultimately comes from deter de deterrence. Uh, if people are aware that there's almost a 100% detection rate, then they are less inclined to take that chance. Certainly, given the current climate, the reduced risk to the employee and the operator through the effective social distancing is a big issue for us and will remain so no doubt for the rest of this year uh, and it also reduces the risk of violence and harassment to the guard who may be conducting the search in there that they have that three meter gap if you as I, as I described to Otto earlier if you're a guard and you're using a wand and you knelt down searching someone's inside leg with a wand you're in quite a prone position if that individual feels that their uh, future might be under threat uh, not a nice place to be if you've just found that they're walking out with a, a pair of iPods in the sock. Uh, a, a big issue is, is the reduced contractual risk. Uh, as anyone on, on this uh, audience from, from a 3PL background will, will acknowledge, we all, we all have SLAs and KPIs from our customers uh, for, for, for loss adjustments, uh, which will probably be very high for, for most of us. 99% uh, plus, I would, would imagine, across most industries, most, most markets. Uh, and we were certainly drifting into certain places where we weren't achieving these numbers with contractual and commercial implications. This technology has allowed us to come back to the right side of our performance uh, indicators uh, and therefore to minimise any contractual risks. And, and ultimately, looking forward, any future tendering opportunities that we might get from the secure uh, secure environment. We certainly feel that we are now in a far more credible place to describe our security uh, installations and culture as opposed to competitors who might not be utilising this sort of technology. Uh, I hope that gives you a, a feel for the, the pressures we came under uh, through the accelerated growth in operations, a product portfolio that did not necessarily lend itself to the out-of-date technologies, uh, and, and subsequently, the uh, the experience we, we've gone through having adopted through Vision. Uh, thank you very much. Back to you, Otto. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, John. That was excellent. So just a quick, uh, sorry, I'm getting a bit of feedback. Just a very quick summary. We hope that we've provided insights into innovative market leading security technology, uh, demonstrated how an LP function can be successfully transformed with commitment, uh, and also then just as John's done so excellently, shown our Clipper has used best-in-class technology to support his customers. I'm going to be advised by app, please, as to whether or not we want to uh, we want to uh, deal with the questions uh, via email, and we'll give a firm commitment. 
firm commitment to answering all of those questions well, or whether people want to if people want to stay on now we are very we're very happy to continue uh, and take questions but i'll be guided by you please yes colin thank you for that so i see that some people are already hooking up but i think we can do some few quick questions with quick answers um and of course i always want to award the first question yeah the first question was from lola and they say do you have an office in mexico Yep, so great question. Um, so touching on our offices, right? So we are a UK based company. So we have offices and uh, a factory in, in the UK, right? That's where our headquarter is. Uh, we have an office close to Washington DC as well as a production location in the US, right? So we have it all in our own, uh, well, we manage our own factories, so to say. Uh, and Mexico is, is absolutely being managed by our team uh, in the US, uh, by our LATAM. Um, uh, account manager. So absolutely, if you have any needs for Mexico, we are here to uh, to help you. Thank you, Otto. And then, of course, um, as with a partly Dutch audience, yeah, there are a lot of questions about prices and costs. Can you <laughs> elaborate a bit more on that, or uh, does people really have to reach out to you to get that kind of information? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think it, it all depends in the end on on uh, on the system they're gonna go for, right? The use cases and building the business case. So an LPC eight system, as we've seen today, MSRP pricing uh, lies around eighty thousand euro. Um, it's a serious piece of equipment technology, uh, but eventually all depends on volumes um, and 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 really type of accessories that 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 are needed. So. Yeah, I would say if, if you are really interested in True Vision, again, and you have challenges, please challenge us, right? We are here to help you. Um, reach out to us um, and, and we are more than happy to, to engage with you on a one-on-one -on -one level. Yeah. Okay, good. Then we have to close it off. I will make a picture of the uh, other questions and pass them on to you, Otto. Sure. Um, yeah. From from the heart of Tapa and Mia, we are a family and all our members know this. I want to thank True Vision, but especially uh, John for sharing his insights on using this system. I always think that um, presenting a use case is difficult because you have to enclose some of your secrets in your company. So thank you very much for that, John. I think it was a very open presentation and we learned all from it. Colin, thank you very much for sharing your experience and, and moderating the uh, the webinar and making my life very easy today. So thank you for that, sir. Thank you very and then much. Otto and Mark, thank you very much for taking us through your systems. I think there are um, yeah, still still a few questions left, which we will pass on to you with, with uh, the people who asked it, the person who asked that question. And I want to thank you very much for partnering up with Tapa and Mia and uh, providing all the information in this webinar. Uh, I wish you all a very good day um, and a re the remaining of the week. Stay healthy, stay safe. And uh, yeah, hope to see each other very soon. Before I close off formally, I want to take your attention, grab your attention that we will have our virtual conference in the week of 8 till 12 November. You can find all information on the website. Uh, this will be a very specific uh, conference. We will not take your time all days. So it will be, uh, as you are used to, type of very effective and very less time consuming. So please orient yourself and register yourself already for the virtual conference. Thank you very much, and I said, have a nice day. Thank you, Edmund. Thank you for everybody who joined. Thank you.